I'm excited, Jordan. Why is that? I'm excited about the big, huge announcement that we got coming up. The listeners of this yes. program are not even going to be able to believe how fabulous this is. Mm-hmm. I've been waiting all week to reveal some of this. I got goosebumps. I can't wait. I can't wait until the listeners of this program, the Insurgents Podcast, hear about the amazing opportunity to get in on the ground floor of the first ever Insurgents Podcast NFT drop. Mm -hmm. Digital trading cards uh, of all your favorite Insurgents uh, hosts and peripheral, you know, characters. Mm Mm-hmm. Such as Ken That's Klippenstein right. as well. We got a big, got a couple of Ken. Some rare Kens. Some rare Kens. There's some of him, like he's outside the glass of the office trying to get in and he can't because <laughs> he's banned. Uh huh. And you can get in on the ground floor, folks. Ninety nine dollars. Ninety nine dollars, which is barely that's nothing. That's barely anything. Mm-hmm. You get for for that small price a digital image which you can then store on your computer. You can trade it with your friends. You can print it out on your printer at home and put it in a frame. No, no, no. no. You can't do that. That's illegal. Don't do that. Yeah. yeah. Do not do that. You misspoke. Rob misspoke. That's right. I misspoke. Do, do not do that. That was a test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was a test. And if you started to go to the printer and check the settings, then you failed. And you're no longer allowed to purchase one of these. But otherwise, but- though, very excited about this opportunity. I can't wait. I think the art is fantastic. It's got, yep. uh, you know, you in a you are you're in a cowboy outfit. Yep. I'm in an astronaut outfit, and I'm also looking like really buff. Uh, we got a construction worker. We got a cop. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> a guy who's in culturally appropriated. Uh, yeah. Uh, native. We actually got we had to cancel uh, apparel. That one. Yeah. yeah, that one got scrapped. <laughs> <laughs> It's just all the village people. <laughs> Left them on the cutting room floor, actually. It was a little... We've moved on. We've moved past this. Uh-huh. That was an editorial uh, oversight. <laughs> on, on top of that, you, you also are entered into our big giveaway. And for people who buy these Insurgents NFTs, which again, huge announcement, you get entered into the yeah. giveaway where winners get the opportunity to subscribe to the show and become a paid intern. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. We it's can a go win. on a thousand person Zoom call. <laughs> huh? And... <laughs> And pitch you, pitch you on subscribing to the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the okay. So that's the thing. I mean, you know, uh-huh. if when you go when you purchase NFTs, when you're buying crypto, when you're doing it, when you're engaging in any of this shit, none of it is real. You're not actually getting anything. You know, you're not actually getting anything of value. When you subscribe to the Insurgents podcast, though, you actually are receiving something. You actually are getting mm-hmm. something in return. You're getting more content. So you're getting That's way right. more than you would ever get if you purchased, you know, Dogecoin or if you invested with like one of these fake uh, scam crypto exchanges like FTX. You get nothing. You just give them your money and they literally just take it and say thank you and then it just goes away forever. But when you right. become a paid intern for the Insurgents podcast, you actually get something in return of value. And, you know, that's, I think that's an important distinction. It absolutely is. But like on a serious note, like, thanks people. Thank you to people for subscribing. Uh, we were pushing for the, uh, we, we wanted to see if there was interest for two a week. Cause that was one of the pieces of feedback we kept getting from listeners that you wanted, um, more content to justify the subscription. So for the past few weeks, we've been doing two episodes a week. And one of those episodes every week has been exclusive for subscribers and uh i mean based on the feedback we've gotten people seem to like it um people have subscribed uh to help keep that sustainable like we really appreciate people subscribing to the show and supporting it um if you can go to the insurgents.substack.com you can subscribe as little as five bucks a month much cheaper than a trump nft which I, we know you're on the fence about buying anyway <laughs> uh, but this is much this is much cheaper and like rob said you actually get something in return, yeah. not only do you get an extra episode every week, you get to become a paid intern yeah. of the insurgents. That can go on your resume, mm-hmm. you know, on your LinkedIn. 
That's huge. Yeah. That's a huge opportunity. <laughs> yep. And we love and it's appreciate huge. all our paid interns. Not so much that Will Snackson guy. I don't know. He's I don't know if you're familiar with one of them, with him. Not the one who's always in our replies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's funny. Uh, you know. Are we calling him out? We're a little. He's a little too familiar. Okay. Let's know your with know your lane, Will. Stay in your lane, sir. Is he bu- is he bullying you? <laughs> one of my regular uh, cyber bulliers. That's why I'm doing. this. I like this guy. Him. Then he's great. Yeah. Damn it. Keep bullying okay. Rob in the replies. <laughs> Um, in all seriousness, we love and appreciate all our paid interns. Thank you very much, everyone who subscribes <laughs> to the program, and even the even the lowly non-subscriber free listeners. We even okay. Let's we not even go appreciate too hard. You. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't subscribe, that's that's okay. But <laughs> I'm just like trashing all our listeners for yeah, some reason. Like, why am I doing that's this? It's okay if they can't. This is um, not good. This is not a good strategy. Um, there is a way you can like donate a subscription to other people, which is pretty cool. I just saw that on Substack recently. So I've been including that button. So if you want to, you can do that. And also subscribers are able to gift three subscriptions too. There's a lot of like cool bells and whistles on Substack that I like um, that other platforms don't have. It's, it's pretty neat. But again, like can't thank you enough for subscribing. Like we've seen uh, a lot of positive feedback and reinforcement that doing two episodes a week is what you all wanted. So that's what we'd like to keep doing. We just We're kind of doing like a good cop, bad cop thing. Here. I'm not going to call f- <laughs> free listeners lowly. I can't. I can't bring myself to do that. You <laughs> fucking pretentious Canadian prick. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over the me elitism there. emanating from Quebec, folks. I can't. I can't stand it. <laughs> um. Who do we have coming on the show this week, Jordan? We've got we've got Brett <laughs> Ehrlich. I alienate any more of our audience here. Yeah, <laughs> we've got Brett this. Ehrlich from uh, the Young Turks. He's been on before. Uh, good friend. He's hilarious. He's great. It, it was a blast. We got into obviously the Trump NFT stuff. You know, as we were recording, if some of you saw, some of you use Twitter. Elon Musk went on like a banning spree and wiped out a bunch of accounts of like prominent liberal and progressive commentators, reporters. Uh, content creators, whatnot. Uh, mostly all of them, I think all of them have been pretty critical of him. So we just talked about that and the people defending him and the people, uh, quote, reporting on the Twitter files. We also opened with like conspiracy talk for a little bit, which is <laughs> not, which was not planned, but fun because the JFK files came out. Yeah. Overall, a really good conversation. I had a blast. Yeah, me too. And let's get to that because it's getting late. Yeah. And um, it was a great conversation, went pretty long too. So, Let's get to our talk with Brett. Uh, He's going to be joining the program right after this. Yeah, well, listen, if you're you're an abolitionist, you should should want Bankman freed. Freed. You should let him out. The the development that's been interesting over the past like day or two has been people looking at his political donations uh, after Bloomberg wrote a story that didn't name anybody else, but uh, alleged that he had a system of straw donors. So people started looking, oh, who is donating that's in his circle that uh, might be one of these straw donors. Is it someone that love, wants to abolish ICE? Uh, I mean, he abolished ICE, dude. Now he's about to abolish prisons because he might be implicated in the straw donor scheme. <laughs> yeah, Sean McKelvey. Sean McKelvey has like a almost like a one to one parallel of maxing out to candidates that Sam Bankman Fried did, and also the total amount of donations that he gave was almost exactly what Sam Bankman Fried donated to huh. uh, some entity that uh, Sean had connections with. Data. I'm not really Weird familiar with him. Well, Data I for say progress. He, he abolished ICE and then he moved on to bigger and better things. Yeah. No, he's out. Of, he got pushed out of Data for Progress. Yeah. They 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 kicked him out. There was like a coup. Yeah. That was what that was happened. Funny. Vote of no confidence because of his his ties to SBF and then uh, claims that he was kind of skewing polling and then vote betting in the predict it. Like political betting markets based on data for progress oh, polling. Wow. 
<laughs> that quite a is fall. so nerdy. Yeah. That is a great like HBO. The want crimes. Yeah, it really wow. is the more one of the more boring scandals that we, we've seen yeah. over the past. It's year. funny though. Why didn't we get any of the FTX money? It seems like it was going everywhere. It, we're yeah, we're, we're big through. like supporters of the Democratic Party and the establishment. Why didn't we get any of that? We're I was altruistic some of their and FEC progressive reports today. And just also, what's interesting, and I think Andrew Perez and I were kicking around an idea today, looking at some of these uh, sh- very clearly shell. Uh, LLCs that a lot of SBF's money was going to and some familiar names might pop in there as well because they are all signs based on their location, filing, and names and how nondescript they are and what their description uh, for their services say. There's some there's some funny business happening and in, in those that no one I don't think has, has looked into yet. Some of our faves may be implicated. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> God, what a great back. tweet. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that, Brett? What? Nancy Pelosi's daughter, when the Epstein stuff was coming out, was like, I know everyone's going to be watching this and some of our faves may be implicated, but like yeah. trying to dismiss the seriousness of basically like the Clintons being involved in the Epstein ring. I love the the specific use of the word fave, <laughs> like the nonchalant, relaxed nature of like, yeah, let's have some of our faves over tonight for din. <laughs> They're it's defo, amazing too because like faves. no one was really implicated he just got assassinated and kind of quietly went away there's the Ghislaine Maxwell trial you'd think maybe of the some of the many powerful people that were heavily implicated in the Epstein trafficking ring maybe could have had some kind of consequences or there could have been some kind of reporting on that kind of stuff but kind of went pretty quiet it's kind very of Jedi mindy yeah it's very like guys it's like parents yeah, like parents, if they set this. a tone of you don't need to worry or ask questions, <laughs> kids will just instinctively be like, I guess there's nothing there. And everybody's like, well, I'm not I'm just going to choose not to mention anything about it. That's very real in newsrooms, I think, in the very <laughs> brief times I've been in like big newsrooms or talk to people who've worked in them. Just like this look you get. It's no one ever says it, but it really is like, uh, yeah, we're just going to move on. Everyone knows how they how not to keep a job. Didn't and it's he not have like, like anyone ever has to say like, like don't don't report on the Clintons. It's just like a because mm. didn't he have like videos and a whole like you know secret safe in the old apartment that was raided by the FBI that presumably had uh, you know compromising material and I'm I'm sure a number of very important and powerful people. Just kind of odd that we never really heard much about that. But do you think if you're at like this party in the in the Epstein Islands, do you think Epstein's going to be like, all right, it's 1130. Now I'm going to bring out the underage girls and let's all drink their blood. Like, I don't. I mean, yeah, I kind of thought that's how it went. Yeah. I don't know. There's like I've been watching Party Down. If anyone hasn't seen Party Down, you should go watch it. It's like it's coming uh, back, right? Uh, yeah, but they're not not like with any of the main, main people. But um, in it, there's a guy who tries to throw an orgy and no one does it like no he's like oh no one believes that there's an orgy it's hard to get the point where everyone just starts orgying you know he can't really yeah. cre- crystallize that moment i just don't think that like you'll you'll have someone to your private island to have access to them sure i just don't i don't foresee a situation where like so a uh, Clinton, uh, Gates, and uh, Trump walk into an island, and now we're going to actually bring out the like child sex portion of the evening. I think oh, they ha- I those are was, separate parties. I thought it was like massage uh, oriented. Yeah. Like that's how they did it. Like, oh hey, here's this uh, you know young girl who's going to give you a massage, and it was like a Deshaun Watson situation where they just kind of like asked for more and i would imagine those were captured yeah i don't know i just i just when i there's plenty of like weird parties that happen that aren't explicitly like as sketchy as people lay them out to be the people who have access to those folks just use that to kind of get less important people to come around and do sketchy things for more direct ends i think they had the robes and the masks the eyes wide shut shit i think they had all that stuff in awesome. that little, in that weird little temple thing on the island. Um, I think the 
the QAnon anonymous guys like went on the island. I think. Uh, before a state or? that'll become a state we, before were they Puerto the Rico. Logs? No, 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 no. Like <laughs> after uh, after everything happened and like he got he I think he he uh, got arrested or something and it was vacant. I think they went on the island. Uh, but I remember I think Julian telling me that that's just like plywood. Like there's nothing in that temple. It's just there and it's plywood. Now. Uh, okay. I mean, you, you know what I mean. Playing it earlier. <laughs> now i mean now there's i would nothing. imagine it probably just took place in his like big house on the island that just that that building looks weird but uh he said it was just plywood what a letdown yeah that's, that's like what's uh, speaking, to think man yeah but speaking of things that we need to start asking questions about rob this is like your super bowl today did you see what just happened obviously yes i know what you're talking about but i'll let you i'll let you uh say it he doesn't know what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you mean? The, the JFK, the JFK documents just got released. Oh shit! I didn't realize. Wow. Ah, thirteen thousand documents just got released. Um, Most of them are stuck curious. together. Am I right? Ow. Uh, I I would imagine they took all the good parts out. Uh, but we'll, we'll would we'll never have happened under more. Trump. Would never have happened under Trump. He'd leave the good parts in. Trump would have. Uh, he, Trump would have dodged the bullet. You know, I think I do. I think I might have kind of a contrarian take about this, which is that, you know, in the uh, Oliver Stone just did a, a new JFK documentary um, a couple of years, a year or two ago that came out, which I saw. And there's a really interesting clip of uh, Alan Dulles, um, former, former director of the CIA and also uh, a central figure of the Warren Commission that investigated JFK's death, even though he was should have been a suspect in JFK's death. Kind of weird that he was investigating it at the same time, but nonetheless, <laughs> there's an interesting clip from Alan Dulles from I think the the uh, like the early 70s when they talk about these decla- these uh, classified documents, and he basically says like you know all the information is already out there. Uh, I don't think there's really anything in these classified documents that's really that interesting or is going to lead to any new revelations and. I actually kind of agree with that. I think, but I don't think the the story, the fictional story that the Warren Commission cooked up, is the real story. But I actually agree that all the information is already out there um, to figure out kind of what was going on. And I think in many ways these like declassified documents are maybe a little bit of a red herring that keeps people kind of guessing. It's like little these these little Easter eggs for this whole JFK researcher community. Um, and it allows it to kind of keep going for years and years and years. But I think I think all the information is already out there, regardless of whatever documents are getting uh, declassified. That anyone that's kind of spent time looking into it, even if you watch the Zapruder film, it's pretty clear. I think what's going on, in my opinion. Yeah, and it was James Franco going back in time and accidentally shooting Kennedy. I watched <laughs> exactly. that documentary series. Exactly. <laughs> I love. I, I think I told you guys. Uh, at the book depository in Dallas, which is also funny because like I'm, I'm I'm there a lot because my partner lives there, and then when other friends are also in town, like and we meet up with them, like that's the one thing they always want to see because that city really doesn't offer a lot other than <laughs> just the JFK site. So we took um, a couple friends there a few weeks ago, and we were looking at the plaque on the book depository, and uh, it's like it, and it was on the on the sixth floor, or whatever in this building that Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly uh, fired the shot that killed Kennedy. And the word allegedly, people have just like carved a box around it. It's like so deep, just like scored this huge groove into this just, like <laughs> like thick metal placard on the side of the building. He's just a patsy. He's uh-huh. the fall guy. Yeah. Um, Do you think there's... So I, I feel like when there's... When they on when someone's gonna read their documents, I hope that there's just like one little corner that's like Kennedy's dad did it, yeah. like that's it. <laughs> By the way, here's a photo of him doing it, shaking hands with Castro as it happened. <laughs> Anyways, that was it. And yes, all the Patsy stuff. Anyhow, so here's uh, the sequencing of his genome, and it's just that afterward. Well, there was even that let the, a story that came out a week or two ago about we have definitive proof that. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was an intelligence asset, and it's like you don't even need you don't even need to look at any of these new documents or new evidence. It's like he was he was from the Office of Naval Intelligence. <laughs> he quote unquote defected to the Soviet Union 
was there for a couple of months and then he just waltzes right back into the United States with no repercussions. They're like, here's your passport again, sir. Welcome back to the country. Um, mm-hmm. Didn't no zero effort to, you know, punish him in any way or to do anything about the fact that he just defected to America's major enemy and then just comes right back. Yeah, that's fine. You know, What's and then he's, yeah, he becomes known as this pro Castro <laughs> guy while simultaneously sharing an office basically down the street from the office of naval intelligence with a bunch of Cuban expatriate anti Castro guys. They're just sharing an office together, you know, him, the, yeah. the Marxist Leninist uh, Castro sympathizer and all these, uh, fascist, uh, Gusano Cuban guys. They're just all hanging out together as one does. It's pretty clear well, that this gotta, guy was, there's going to save money on rent. Yeah, of course. You have a so how interested in it? How interested in it are you guys? Like if you found out who killed Kennedy, or how much time have you collectively spent or will you spend knowing this is coming out, looking into the new documents and the new evidence? Like, what does it do to your overall, like, happiness level? <laughs> I'm not big on it, Rob. I probably won't Rob's look, like I said, I'm, guy than I yeah, am. yeah. I mean, I probably won't look into the documents that much because, I, like, I think I've, I already have a pretty decent idea of what actually went on. But uh, yeah, it's not really about happiness. I just think it's an it's an interesting kind of like uh, inflection point in American history where, um, you know, it could have gone in one in a certain direction and then kind of veered off in an even more horrible direction than where it was already going. It's weird to talk about Kennedy as like as he was, of course, not this like saint or anything like that is perfect person. But I think, you know, reading books like uh, the Jakarta Method or looking into some of the speeches that Kennedy gave about the third world. And he definitely had a different idea about how to treat these emerging uh, anti-colonial movements in the third world and um, wanting to allow them space and to kind of grow and be partners with them rather than had taking this heavy handed approach of overthrowing and invading and, you know, doing the coups and the invasions, which, of course, immediately escalated uh, as soon as he was uh, assassinated. So I just think it's an it's an interesting example of the ways that like as much as we talk about you know the the white house and the president of the united states and who has power in the u.s government you see that there's this power that you know they don't really have uh, have the ability to to challenge all that much and he did try to challenge it and that's when so that's what you think happened the cia <laughs> killed kennedy because they wanted to coup south america uh, say, well, I don't they know. wanted to they wanted to escalate in Vietnam. They wanted to escalate the Vietnam War. Kennedy was starting to talk about pulling out the advisors and the he wanted to get out of Vietnam. That's the story anyways. Wanted more of a detente with the Soviet Union. And um, yeah, you just see this explosion as soon as Kennedy's out of the picture of yeah, the, the Vietnam immediately escalates, turns into this massive 10 uh, year quagmire, which was a huge gift to the weapons manufacturers and like it was just a a fucking bonanza for the military industrial complex and then of course they're going into indonesia they're going into latin america africa and all these other places um in the wake of this and uh yeah i don't think it was the cia really but i do think it was uh probably a, CIA, a team of, one of, of the CIA's. cuban expats a, a catching kennedy in a triangulation a firing p- position multiple shooters that put the final kill shot coming from the front uh, low angle trajectory which you can watch in the clip he's just like you know just smacks him in the head and it goes back back into the left hmm. back into the left that's the f- famous the famous saying yeah back mm-hmm. and to the left uh yeah, those kinds of analyses really just indicate to me how far America has come politically. Only, the only person I really heard outside of this story talk about Kennedy was when I was in Pittsburgh recently for a little get together with some close friends called Netroots Nation. Oh, I was uh, there. We got an yeah, Jorby, Jorby was there. We were in. I was in an Uber with my boss from the Young Turks, and she and just talking to the Uber driver who was like. I love all that stuff that uh, that Trump's doing. I would never vote for a a Republican or for a Democrat ever. And, and my boss goes, "So which Democrat would you vote for? What was the last Democrat you would you'd vote for?" And uh, he goes, "Oh, Kennedy." It's like, "Why Kennedy?" Because he said about sacrifice. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I was like, oh, okay, this guy seems to be kind of into 
Uh, we're all in it together. Fine. Not very Trump-like. He doesn't ask anyone to sacrifice. He doesn't sacrifice anything. But then he goes, also, he was Catholic and he wouldn't put up with any of this abortion crap. <laughs> Oh, and the Muslims. It's like, yeah. got it. Got it. I see what but, you're about. Yeah. But just uh, just how warped and strangely ancient and ahistorical one has to be to say, like, yeah, Kennedy's my guy, Rel- well, you know, relative to today's political. It is amazing how Kennedy's been folded into the whole, like, QAnon Trump mythology. He's such a central figure. Now you have these weird... These weird people that coalesce around Dallas, like now once every eighteen months or whatever, because the prophecy date when the re- the return is going to happen is coming, and it just doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, it's so crazy. I may be kind of into a, this shit, but I'm not one of these people. Like, let's not let's not get too crazy with this. Right. You take a real true mystery, the one real true mystery, and then fold it into a bunch of stuff that, like, no, we know that's all bullshit. But yeah. Kennedy, who killed Kennedy, right? There are some mysteries in the world. Uh, Trump got it solved from <laughs> the the conspiracy that I cling to. I'm not a huge JFK guy, but uh, the conspiracy that I really am convinced is true is the is Flight 93. Like you think they, they shot, shot it shot down? It down. For sure, got shot down. Yeah, it was just like the oh, last time I was in LA. We were we were playing. I think I don't know what you were like tinkering around in the back. And we were sitting at, like uh, on the patio, uh, uh, your wife Audie and I, Brett, and um, mm-hmm. we were going around saying like what conspiracies we thought were real, and we looked at the timeline for Flight ninety three because I couldn't like re- really remember, <laughs> and like the, the amount of time between the planes hitting the towers and the White House, and all other planes uh, being grounded was like I, it was like a half an hour or something, which would just like which is like an eternity if you're trying to like, you know, hyper scrutinize everything and you wanted to scramble jets and it did like a huge U-turn, uh, <laughs> like going like over Western Pennsylvania and swinging around back to DC, like, to, like aiming right, basically right at DC. Um, I just, that, that, that there's just, there's no way that thing happened the way it did. And they made, they built this like kind of patriotic story out of it. I don't know. Like my, so when I was in college at Leland Stanford Junior University, there was like this uh, rivalry, Cal and Stanford, and the thing you win is the axe, and uh, the whoever has it, the other team tries to steal it from you, and all of that. And my buddy Mark was on Tree Protection Services, which is the group that you have to like, um, like protect the tree. I promise this will get back to nine eleven. <laughs> You have to protect the tree, and it's like the most like jazz. This guy is like a bobsled gold medal push champion track star. This guy Mark, and everyone else is like these jacked people that are like, yeah, I'm really passionate about saving this, this, uh, this, you know, whatever. And so the people on the cow side had equally passionate quasi psychos, like really proud of whatever organization they belong to and there was this one guy who was particularly like involved in it that they knew and he kind of had a reputation for doing stuff like like i will go all out to protect this thing and he would like go tackle people that came at the cal bear or whatever and like pass them off to security and mark and this dude had like this intense interaction where the guy was essentially like let's roll and do this and he was the and he ended up being the let's roll guy like that patriotic story is the let's roll guy and my buddy mark was just like yeah that checks out knowing that guy he would go to the cockpit and do whatever it takes to save you know if he's fighting that hard for oski the (laughs) cal bear i'm pretty sure he'll fight that hard for uh you know, against the terrorists. I don't think like I don't think it's beyond reason that, they, it, that they would shoot it down. Mm. Obviously, it's like it's like no, they would never they, they would never shoot down a civilian airliner. Well, of course they would. The U.S. government. Um, I guess the thing that makes me believe it is that there's like calls from the people on Flight 93 with their family members at the time, and they knew that the other planes that had been hijacked had been crashed into things. So 
I think I, they had a basic idea of what was going on, that the plane was not going to be landing. So I guess I could see, given that, that it's not that unreasonable to think that they would be like, okay, well, fuck it. Let's try and just do something here. If you do want to get, that's really just barely scratching the surface. If you want to get into 9-11 theories, oh boy, I got, I got, I got some material on that. Well, we know it was Maybe an inside job. Yeah, well. I, mean, I got a, I got a music video for it. <laughs> music video for everyone <laughs> that he plays. I fucking love that. That music video is yeah. so funny. The Building 7 <laughs> one. Maybe we can save this for a 9-11 special the next time. We can do a 9-11 yeah. truth My truth anniversary. Pod. Oh, yeah. Brett and his wife got married on 9-11. <laughs> is that, was that like a conscious decision? Was that like a meme? Or like, it's like you when just, you're you sitting just... around going like, what what date should we enshrine in the history of this family that we'll never forget? Yeah. Someone goes like August 7th. I'll be like, I have, I mean, that's a family name, but like, I'll be like August 19th. I'll be like, that made me feel nothing. And then we're like September 11th. Yeah. <laughs> we had a reaction to it. So we said it. And uh, we kind of planned it and told the family, like, I think we're getting married on September 11th and then forgot about it. And then my si- now sister-in-law was like, are you guys still getting married next week? <laughs> and we said, uh, yeah. She's like, yeah, because I have it off of work. So we just went to Vegas. <laughs> it turns well, out it was my grandparents' wedding anniversary, but I did not know that when I uh, when we, we scheduled the chapel in Vegas. It's funny too because you could be with people and something kind of cool would happen that would make you feel happy or nostalgic and be like, you know, I haven't felt this way since September 11th. You're like, whoa, what? <laughs> yeah, my we- my wedding day, you know. One of the best days of my <laughs> life was September 11th. I was wasted, <laughs> not a care in the world. Oh, that so could be that's that's probably clicked a good out of context. <laughs> no, let's keep it in there. Yeah. Uh, we should probably introduce our guest though. Returning, yeah. returning guest, Brett Ehrlich. Brett, you're back. What's up? I am so happy to be here. There's a lot of banter. Yeah, we bantered. I didn't know we were uh, recording for half of it. And then I was like, <laughs> I had a feeling we were. And then I just, I really turned on the charm at a certain point. Yep. You noticed it. Oh, yeah. I heard it. Yeah. It's like a switch. Yep. You know, when you got it, when you got that star quality and your big yeah. break, you got to bring it. Thank you for having me on. I'm uh, Brett Ehrlich, and I work at the Young Turks, and I am eight and a half feet tall with uh, just the most generosity any human could muster. Wonderful. We're often saying this. Here, Brett. Yeah, yeah. Um, we uh, Last time we had you here, it was for the uh, Oscars slap. Mm. It was a big, big news story. Which I will talk now. about on December 26th at 9, 8 central on ABC For my 12th consecutive ABC's of the Year, where we talk about the highs and lows, the highlights and lowlights of the year that was me, Robin Roberts, who knows who else. I need to actually watch that this year. Do you? Yeah, I've got to support my bros. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I got you. I mean, like, in the years that I've known you, I've never watched, but I, like, knew you did it, and I always, like, forgot to watch. Um, This year, I'm going to... I'm going to be sure to watch. It's also like just funny that you're part of it. You're just it is so much strange. bigger than them. It's strange, but uh, yeah, when it goes from like, all right, we're going to talk to the person who just suffered one of the most tragic accidents ever to befall a human being randomly. We cried two seconds ago, and now Brett's going to joke about Pete Davidson's penis. <laughs> are you, or wait, are you able to say what you talk about this year? Uh, basically, it's one of those shoots where you just sit down, they ask you questions for like three hours. Um, oh, but yeah, there's a lot of different in. topics. We got, there's always something about the Royals, uh, but really everything else is, uh, we talk about politics, pop culture. What do we talk about? Kanye West, Pete Davidson, uh, uh, the, the Alex Jones trial, the Johnny Depp and Amber Herb heard trial. It's a lot of what happened. Basically, it's stuff that you're like, I hope they talk about that. We cover, and then also stuff you forgot happened that year comes back up, and you're you're glad we gave it a little moment in the sun. Yeah, nice, um, cool. I'll check it out now. Brett, there's some big news again this week. Like you're you every time you're on here, you're on here for a big news news week. Uh, former President Donald Trump had a big announcement he was going to make this week, and he just launched, or he just announced it today, uh, which, you know, grabbed the headlines, captivated 
America. I think millions of people were tuning in for this big announcement, which was the launch of the new collecti- collect- collectible... <laughs> like the little Trump killing it. NFTs. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm I'm worked up. I'm so excited. I gotta I gotta I know. Out. <laughs> I know. You can you pick some? one. Yeah. Absolutely. Of course I am. Yeah. How could how could I turn down the opportunity for this highly exclusive like one of one of two hundred thousand Donald yes. Trump digital trading cards? That's the amazing thing though, right? It's not even an NFT. Like it's not like there's just one thing that you can have like a fake ownership of through this like blockchain you know, uh, receipt or whatever, or, or ledger. It's literally like you just, you own it, you get the blockchain thing, but there's still like thousands of other of the same thing that other people also own. It is so stupid when he, so <laughs> this story seems to be broken down into a few beats, a few dramatic moments in terms of how we all as Americans and, you know, just citizens of the planet experience this momentous occasion. The first was when he said, I have a huge announcement tomorrow. Now, you saw it. You guys (laughs) saw that, right? You saw that there was a lot of speculation. When when you heard there would be a huge announcement, when you saw that tweet, what were your speculations as to what that announcement might be? Uh, VP candidate. Exactly same. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking all that much about it. Um, I saw speculation, though, that like, oh, is he going to pull a Kirsten Cinema because his poll numbers are slipping and DeSantis is rising. He's going to announce an, as an independent or something. He's going to do an independent run, maybe, and put this 12D chess move on the on the GOP that'll force them to support him. Is it going to be a yeah, big VP candidate splashy announcement? I saw that was the speculation that I saw. I, right, and that might still come. <laughs> and if that does come, it doesn't make sense for DeSantis to run. That's my favorite part about that speculation. At that point, it only ruins DeSantis's chances. <laughs> and in doing that, DeSantis could calculate everything else perfectly as he has. And originally, I thought all these poll numbers saying DeSantis was in the lead over Trump were all just psyops from the right. Because they were all like, they were all polls from like totally legitimate club for growth action surrogacy pack, right? says that, you know, Donald Trump is a stinky pants, but then it's like actual polling organizations. And so if you're DeSantis, you're just sitting there going like, I'm not going to make any sudden movements. I got months and months and no pending criminal investigations. Why would I ever get in there? Um, and and uh, if he does and he plays it just perfectly and then Trump's like, actually, no, I'm going to be an independent. It ruins DeSantis. It just splits the Republican vote and it's over. And that would be so funny. Um, but he did not. No, it was not that. Announced that. I did think it was a vice presidential candidate. And I was like, I hope it's Marjorie Taylor Greene. Because that would indicate that Donald Trump really has given up on the idea that he is a fancy pants. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this is the guy who's like, I am going to have a golden house that I live in that's beautiful and i am nothing but the best there's a guy who had a uh a airline that went under because he wanted so passionately to have a golden toilet that was too heavy but it's like class 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 all the way he you know he's class to the person who doesn't know what classy actually is but he still believes he's classy to say Marjorie Taylor Greene is my running mate is to finally admit, like, I am nothing of the sort. That's what I wanted. But bear that in mind as he then reveals that a big announcement from a recently announced presidential candidacy, something he himself describes as a huge announcement, is actually the digital Trumpy bear. Uh, Good guy. I I really like that the prizes. I was looking at the prizes and the rules around them. Um, me too. Uh, the uh, I think you you texted me about it, Brett. The golf thing. That was one of them. Uh, it says in the rules that you get to play golf with Trump for one hour. It's framed as a round of golf. You're not going to get through 18 holes in one hour. So like, what is he going to do? Like just kick you? I mean, I would imagine if anything happens, if the game's abruptly ended for somebody, it's going to be the winner, not him. But he's going to finish the game. So you're on like the sixth hole, like chipping onto the green. He's like, all right, buzzer goes off. Time's up. Get out of here. See ya. And he finishes the round. I, I have a lot of logistical questions. Yeah. Bye-bye. 
but also the zoo the the price because you know like with contest rules you have to say the estimated price one of the prizes is a zoom call with trump one-on-one only one person wins it that's listed value zero (laughs) dollars the one of like two thousand uh group zoom call that's listed as priceless like (laughs) you can't put a price on no. Being part of 2,000 people on a Zoom call listening to Trump. That, I thought that was very a very nice touch. The thing that got me was the dinner with Trump. It's like, you too can win a dinner. You can win a dinner with me, Donald Trump. <laughs> that would actually be fun, though. Right, but when you read what that prize is, it's actually you're one of 2,000 people in the room, the dinner with him. And oh. It does list the value of that at $75, which really gives you like, they're going to give you $75 worth of food and drink at that experience where if you're in a, if there's a dinner with 2000 people at it, it is a $2,000 a plate donor dinner that you will also be at. I just think that's amazing. And you're just going to be someone in the corner at table 19 What does in the room with him entail? You're going to be in a ballroom or are you just going to be like at the facility and he'll be there for like five minutes as he walks by and leaves? I love it. But you don't have to actually enter. You don't have to buy a $99 photo of Trump uh, shooting lasers from his eyes in order to enter that sweepstakes giveaway. There's actually, if you go on the website, you just have to like... You have to pay for postage, but you can send a um, index card with your name and address on it and you enter to win and you can do that up to a hundred times. So if the insurgents viewer li- or listeners have nothing else to do, I say enter to win. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. <laughs> Honestly, I, I was I was looking at that today. That would be funny if like if you're listening to this and you have the time and want to do that. There are rules on their site. We should all flood that because uh, then I saw they'll also they'll send you then they'll send you an entry code for the giveaway. So then you have to go back to the site and enter that code. But like we should flood that with and get a bunch of codes. And if someone wins that dinner, like go in and record it. Like I I really want to know like what's going on in there. Or it'd be even funnier if one of us won the golf game. That would be fucking hilarious. You could actually hit him with a golf ball. By- <laughs> Sorry, my game's a little rusty. <laughs> Whack. Oh my god. I'm just wondering about How that many... Zoom call. Like what if you're on a two thousand person Zoom call with Trump, like functionally, what's the difference between that and just sitting there in the comfort of your own home and just watching like Trump say some stuff on YouTube? Like what real realistically, like what is the difference between these two activities? The only thing I could think of is there's no way that they activate your audio at any point, right? No. Their only thing I can think of is one time yeah, is is he might acknowledge that we have the winner of the digital Trumpy Bear sweepstakes giveaway here, wave, and they see your face for a second. That's it. How many people want, do you I think want are, that. you want that? Mm-hmm. I'm in. How many people do you think are gonna buy the NFT or digital trading card collection? Honestly, probably thousands, and not just for not for the not for the JPEGs, basically, but for the chance to win dinner with him. They are so bad. The art is so <laughs> bad. It's it's, it's very atrocious. funny. It's very funny, but objectively not good. Yeah, um, like I don't know if do funny the, is what he was going for. Right? Do the people? Because like a lot of the artwork, like the artistic styles, which are let's face it, all AI generated, <laughs> like. Every I feel like Trump himself was going through what was the name of the like Pexar or whatever the the uh, AI art generator was. You send like a photo of your face and it spits out like artistic styles that everybody did last week. I feel <laughs> like he just did that because he's so damn bored and only is running for president to avoid certain like legal consequences of his actions. And he's like, I think we should sell this. And he put it in there like. They're so, so atrociously bad. I just don't know if anyone... But, like, those artistic styles existed before when you saw, like, the Trump as Rocky imagery. And people... I don't think people were ironically, like, buying that artwork. 
they were into it they see him that way and that's just when you're like oh my god these yeah. people's votes matter as much as mine good god <laughs> i mean asking about you know the the actual the trading cards whatever the fuck you want to call them it does lead to sort of an interesting question though which is does trump still have the sauce he seems honestly he seems very diminished he seems kind of washed he seems a little bit sauceless um the midterms were a big a public spectacular failure for him. All the people that he was endorsing or a huge major, majority of them failed to win. It doesn't seem like he quite has the same ability to dominate the headlines and the news cycles and to um, do all the Trumpy things that made him kind of rise above everyone else in 2015, 2016. What do you two think? Is is he done? Like, is he going to be for a while? I mean, in early in early uh, early in Biden's administration, when they didn't seem like they were going to really accomplish anything at all, it seemed very very likely that not only would he come back and be the nominee in twenty four, but had a good good chance of winning. But now I'm starting to kind of second guess that. I don't know if he's got the juice or the sauce. What do you two think? I don't. I, he he seems like he's lost it. Like his his announcement speech was so low energy. Like uh, he doesn't, he doesn't seem like he's got the same. Sleepy like, Don. Yeah, I'm, honestly though, like he doesn't seem like he has the same drive or passion or enthusiasm <laughs> like he did, when, even when he was president. But certainly in 2015, 2016, yeah, he's like, I'm he's mostly just off. doing this to not go to jail now. That's my main. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what, honestly the what reason it seems I'm doing like. this. He's yeah. a yeah, and and his first act as a official candidate is to sell stuff that's ridiculous. <laughs> is to do like. We didn't have enough budget to get the my pillow commercial producer. So we're going to just get the ones who do the like collect all these coins. Well, that's what I was saying. That was my producer. first thought when I watched this video today of Trump and the the NFT collection was I felt like one of those nights when you fall asleep in front of the TV and you wake up at 3:47 with the weird like infomercial programming block advertising all kinds of weird products and spray on hair and whatever that's what it felt it was that level of quality it was almost like tim and eric like level yeah. how ridiculous the ridiculousness of it there's a lot of elements that go into analyzing the chances of someone winning an election that's two years away right and one is general generally speaking specifically in the republican party over the last however many years the uh, the leader of those have gone have been like Herman Cain was leading the polls for the Republican primary in 2000, whatever it is, 12 or something. Right. That was a reality of the situation. Mike Gravel, the Democratic side, was like very high on in the polls for a while. Um, you know, Rick Santorum lasted a very long time. There is some stuff we look back on and are like, oh, my God, how did that guy have a chance? And then the person, somebody emerges, right? The difference, though, but with Trump this time versus last time is everybody had a prevailing sentiment about what politicians were at large. And no outsider had really showed up and just completely outdone them in the television medium the way Trump did in those initial debates. And so there was a freshness to it. There was something different. The The stale thing out there was politicians. The new thing out there was Trump. Now, I, I'm of the belief that without COVID, stuff never got that bad. It, stuff would never have gotten bad enough for generic white people for Trump to lose to Biden yeah. or Bernie or anyone. Yeah, I but agree then that you. happened. People are going to forget that that's why Trump lost. People are going to think to themselves, they're going to forget that there was a giant recession as a result of a pandemic that was to a certain extent his fault and a certain extent not at all his fault. It just happened on his watch. And of course, that person's going to take a huge hit. People are just going to know that they remember Trump losing. And for a while, you've got that thing that a lot of uh, political parties do, which is like, I want to have someone who doesn't have that much of a history. That's my great hope. And see if I can go long enough without some kind of history emerging around that guy or having that guy do a huge enough gaffe 
where he's going to make it through the campaign cycle and win at least the primary and hopefully the election. And that's what they have with DeSantis. So the Republican establishment is actually, as things are uh, panning out, especially with their ability to kind of create a narrative, which they're way better at than Democrats. And they're already having people trot it out, which is we want Trump's policies, but not loser Donald. People who've said that on air are Mike Pence, sure, who's going to run. Um, and that'll be fun, but he'll lose. They're uh, Laura Ingram, who said it on air. Literally, we want Trump's policies, but no Trump. And even Lauren Boebert, who on local Colorado news said, I'm never going to abandon Donald Trump. But, you know, Ron DeSantis is America's mayor. Like, direct quote, Ron DeSantis, he's America's mayor, and he's got the same policies. They're already trying that. People who have seen the negative side of being in Trump's orbit, people like Lauren Boebert, who almost lost in Ruby Red Rifle, Colorado, are like, uh, even I'm hedging my bets and I'm a psychopath. I think that they're going to push really hard. But the one, to answer your question specifically, like, who knows? Maybe he's he's just standing next to Ron DeSantis. He's going to be better and Ron DeSantis, as much experience as he has as a as a jag off, and uh, what is he like? Was he jag or some kind of like military cop? He's like a war crime and, lawyer. Yeah, so he's he's a, he's that guy. He he's done you know TV, but he is like a real big wiener. He's a real yeah. weenie. Talk about not having it, sauce. He doesn't have any sauce. People just pretend he has sauce, but he hasn't had to show it. Yeah. And similarly, the last batch in 2016 of those Republican um, establishment politicians never had to prove sauce outside of like the the weak sauce environment of a political debate before. And Trump brought it and they did it. And maybe he'll be able to outshine them again. But that really is his only hope in all of this. And not to be discounted is the mainstream media really kind of preferring to have Trump in the conversation over not having Trump in the conversation. So you'll see a lot of the analysis, I think, unexpectedly from the CNNs and the MSNBCs looking to be like, "Mm, DeSantis didn't really have it today, did he? And feed that everywhere they still can have influence. Um, Yeah, if I had to bet, I don't think Trump wins the nomination. And uh, you guys both know I'm a very successful better these days. So. (laughs) <laughs> I've been did you hit that evidence. parlay yeah. did you hit that eleven hundred dollar yeah. 10 bet parlay it was only a four-way parlay ten dollar ten dollar bet ten dollar yeah, it, yeah. it hit for eleven hundred i can't i can't believe it oh it did hit uh, you i thought you were like yeah got my fingers crossed you no, sent me those Lakers, where Clippers, it's like the, or the lakers um lakers celtics, celtics game yeah that one hit Way to go, dude. Jordan's sending me Thank this you. stuff, and I'm just like, it's so enticing. And I'm just like, really, the fucking last thing I need right now is to develop a gambling problem. This is, the, <laughs> this is not what I need right now. you got to not send me this stuff. Um, uh, one thing Jesus. I do want to acknowledge, and I realize it like really specifically dates this episode uh, beyond the Trump NFT stuff, is like right now on Twitter, we're recording this on thursday night it's 8 p.m eastern there is like a wave of suspensions yeah, of like this. liberal and progressive are you guys watching this yeah. happen it's like every time i refresh some new like liberal account just got suspended like donnie sullivan from cnn i think it started with aaron rupar and then donnie sullivan matt bender, matt bender yeah. ryan mack uh and it seems like everyone who uh tweeted about the elon jet tracker account getting suspended like people who were like really were following that and posting about it a lot they are now they are now suspended and like it just keeps going uh good to know that i wasn't the only one sitting here and all talking while simultaneously scrolling twitter that's good i was refreshing being like am i am i next oh no i am um, sorry I, I i respected you guys enough to pay attention <laughs> to what the hell we were talking about my bad I close. All I don't respect up. myself or others, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I am seeing that though. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty brazen. He's just going after people that are reporting on him now. Yes, Drew Harwell at the Post, who has been pretty critical over the past couple of days. I just want to take a second to say we here at the Insurgents, and I think I speak on behalf of all of our guests that we've ever had, uh, including Matt Bender, including and, Matt Bender all, yeah. and our listeners, and I think we're all in agreement. 
Tesla cars are the best, like yep. most coolest and safest really cool. cars yeah. on the road. I think uh, we are 100% spaceship. behind the vision. I love them. Uh, they're the best. Please don't suspend us. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it, Muskie. I dig off Brosefino. Um, I don't care. It's hard with it. I'll fly in the face of danger. And when I fly there, I don't care if someone reports my flight data. You know what's crazy? I was just told on a, uh, a call-in show, The Lever to the other night, by Matt Taibbi, that Elon deeply cares about censorship. I oh. can't believe. Matt Taibbi. Can we talk about Matt Taibbi saying, like, you know what's funny? I do. Did you listen to my interview with him? Not yet. I didn't see. I was because I, I spoke to you about this, Jordan. It's like I know we were both people that he got, he at got one mad point at were definitely were definitely uh, influenced by Taibbi. Was it because of a fan of his his writing, yeah. his journalism, his commentary? It's very bizarre to see the the trajectory that he's been on over the last eighteen months or so until the point that he's like talking to Ben Shapiro, talking about unironically saying like conservatives are getting better at comedy and it's making the left nervous. And it's like, Matt, yeah. what the fuck are you talking about, dude? I don't know. And he cites it's very he cites Matt Walsh's anti trans yeah. film. Like that's what's funny. Like what's funny that's about the really that? funny yeah. What the Nothing's hell? less funny than telling people that stuff's actually the when you think about it not funny. <laughs> Like, that's just not a good experience. What's hilarious is Matt Taibbi's face when he's telling you what's not funny. Guys. <laughs> like, as it's melting off the bone. Guys. As he looks like fucking, um, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio when he's trying to pull his <laughs> saggy skin back. Men in black. Guys, nice. I'm cool. No, you are a sludge troll, Matt Taibbi. What? He is not funny. Like, these people who used to be fine, but he's such a pick-me girl, it's disgusting. Yep. Oh, everyone, he's one of those, he's just another stan. So stupid. Like, what's so frustrating is, like, my position on Twitter in general is, like, it's it was fucking Jack's company, right? And, bef and they fought over whose company it was. And when it's your company, you can do stuff with it because it's a company. And everyone who's saying that that Elon Musk saved this all of discourse in America and is blindly pretending that he's not doing the exact same thing that Jack did just with a different set of like what he thinks yeah. is right. Both of whom are doing what's best for them specifically, both with different levels of experience running this type of company. I mean, running social media is not rocket science, and that's why Elon Musk sucks at it. Yeah, can you believe this explosive story that in the wake of January 6th, a bunch of executives at Twitter and lawyers whose job it is to figure this out had conversations about what to do and weren't really sure and kind of ended up figuring something out. It's like, yeah, I can believe that. Who, who, what is that? What new is what new information is being expressed here? Fucking bizarre. What did he get mad at you about, uh, Jordan? So I, I like we went into that conversation, um, Sirota, me and a couple of other other writers and editors Um we had a meeting beforehand it basically recognized like this is probably not going to be the most well-received conversation we have on this show and like we want to make sure we're not just being like everything about this and your role in it is great so like we wanted to lay out look look it is interesting to get a look at how they handle these things um it's definitely like of interest it's not like the biggest story um, which some people, I guess we'll get into that in a bit, but some people thought it was like, just, uh, it, this is the biggest story since the Pentagon Papers. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we were asking him like questions that weren't just softballs. So I was going to be that guy. Like I was going to be the person who asked the tough questions and David kind of like moderated and just set, set him up basically, basically being like, all right, what's in this? What'd you find? What's interesting? And then I would come in with like, you know, the good cop, bad cop. I would come in with the bad cop questions so i said like pretty early on so a lot of people are have been disappointed with your role in this um and your uh you know evolution over time because you could call it a de-evolution i didn't say that specifically but basically being like how kind of like your involvement and how you approach these things over time has changed and he initially took issue with that he's like what, what issues are they having and it's like it would have been a distraction but like explicitly like you know things like praising the walsh film uh, but I was just like, I'll let them speak for themselves and just trying to keep them on the issue. So I said, and I pointed out in his book, Hate Inc., he talked about the way some journalists are handpicked to be the recipient of leaks. 
because the people who leak these documents to them know they will be they will, it will result in more flattering coverage and he was like whoa, whoa wait, wait, what did i say in hate inc and then tried to like draw a distinction between his examples of that in the book and what he was doing and i said like a couple like questions like how do you respond to criticism that you're ultimately doing PR for Musk, which is something that he's not new to hearing. People have been saying it for like a week and a half now. Um, but I just wanted to get him like on the record to talk about it. But also I wanted to know, did he approach Twitter for these documents or did they reach out to him? And he, he like initially dodged that question. And then later in the interview, while saying something else, he said, and that's why I was picked for this story. So he admitted later on tacitly that they reached out to him for this story. And I think that's of interest. And he really took issues. Like, I don't care who gives me these. I don't care what Musk's motives are. And I think that was another thing I really wanted to hit was the motives thing. Uh, because it's very clear, like, why they picked these things. Like, of what interest is the Hunter Biden laptop story? Really, nationally, beyond just that was, with, like we've talked about in previous previous episodes, that was supposed to be Republicans' October surprise. And I think Twitter saw that it was a little confusing on how they'd handle it, how they handled it or, or how they would handle it. And ultimately what they did, they pro- maybe they didn't handle it the best way. I think that's a debate worth having. But it's not like the biggest story. It's not the like it's not this huge groundbreaking story. And the examples of, quote, suppression on the platform that they used came at the behest of the campaign, not somebody in power at the time, not the government at the time. And. The links, when people looked up the links in the Internet Archive for what they were, it was it was nudes. So it's like, is this really that big of a deal? They don't want they don't want Biden's son's nudes on Twitter. Like that seems like a decently reasonable ask. Whether or not you think they should have complied is, I guess, subjective, probably along partisan lines. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. And he, he was he was not thrilled with uh, those questions and. Uh, claimed that even discussing Musk's motives and all of this were, was a propagandist distraction and tried to draw parallels to attacks on Edward Snowden as the leaker to distract from what was in those documents. And that's totally different. Elon, or, uh, Elon Musk is the second richest guy on the planet and owns this platform. And we're now seeing will suspend people based on viewpoint. Very clear. I mean, we did, we knew that was going to happen regardless, and it has happened. But now, right now, as we're recording this, you know, multiple people have been suspended for either being critical of Musk or covering the uh, the, the the jet tracker accounts suspension and stuff that purportedly happened to his his kid last night in L.A. They're being suspended, but I I, I, I it's it's totally different than Edward Snowden, who was like a rank and file Booz Allen Hamilton staffer who saw what was happening and leaked it to reporters a, a, a few different reporters who could then go through the material and report that out you know he he was a he didn't have like a a, a motive to shape how uh booze allen like a company that he controlled operated or the perception of booze allen hamilton or the nsa you know he, he was worried about um uh people's civil liberties being uh, affected This is Musk trying to frame the previous administration as or the previous ownership of Twitter and leadership of Twitter as being fueled by partisan uh, motives. And as we're seeing right now, as we record this and over the past few weeks, he, too, is doing the same thing, just like what Brett said, just with a different political bent. Yeah, it's it's so transparent that what Musk is essentially trying to do is just he he got basically suckered into all right the whole thing is nerd prom right when they talk about the the white house correspondence dinner it's nerd prom and that that feeling that the theme behind that is exactly freaking matt taibbi and these inside the beltway douchebags that are absolutely trying to be part of an in cool club and the in cool club for a very long time was just Hollywood and was just politicians that are currently have power and you want to be around it. And there's tons of people who gravitate toward that. They're trying to create a new one. But the new one is not about coolness. It really is about nerds trying to be cool. And not in a good way. It's like people who are who you know, I'm I've been a nerd for a very long time. And 
you have there's nerds who are like embracing their nerdiness and there's nerds who are so mad they've been called nerd that their entire life becomes about turning the jocks and the cool people into like losers and ruining their lives and when you do stuff like that you absolutely positively lose the moral high ground because you're no longer seeking what's right you're seeking revenge and that's what Matt Taibbi's doing. He's on the outs. No offense, everybody. He's got a sub stack, so he like needs the gig, bro. That's what it is. He needs the gig, bro, and he really wants to be part of this new thing. And it's him and Barry Weiss who did the original like intellectual dark web story, licking like freaking Dave Rubin's yeah, balls. Barry Weiss, who cares so much about freedom of speech and expression that she's she spent her college years. Trying to censor, uh, you know, Palestinian activists and her, her pro-Palestinian uh, professors, and it's so transparent and it's so stupid. And anyone who gives you shit for pointing out the fact that this might be a PR play for uh, Elon Musk is gaslighting you and is gaslighting everybody. Come on, bro. As Matt Taibbi, and then as you say, admitted to you, he was sought out because he's pick me, because he's vengeful, because he'll write something like that. This guy thinks he's a he's a, a funny bro. Like he does a show with Katie Halper, who has anyone tried to have a fucking conversation with her? It's impossible. She's a psychopath, I'm sorry. But like, I've been in a room with Katie Halper. I'm like, who the fuck is this person? There's no, there's, she's just got a fucking screw loose. I'm not saying she's bad at any analysis. I'm saying like, bro, if you want to be around the funny people, the ones who have like that, that part of their personality that can sense what's, what humans do and what humans don't do and what's funny and what's not, you're not around that. You're not. Um, but yeah, there's more, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I don't know. I think, um, I, you, I think you two spoke on it quite a lot. I mean, I, I think it's an example, both Taibbi and Greenwald, and there are many other examples of this, are what happens when your your entire ideology seems to be like, liberals bad. And your, your analysis is not really going any further than that. And I agree with a lot of that analysis. I've complained many times uh, here and on Twitter and Twitch and everywhere where else I can uh, about, you know, ineffectual liberals and the problems that they have. And... I think maybe if you look into Twitter, there's or big tech in general, there's a story there about the crossover between the liberal establishment and these social media companies. Maybe there's a story there about the crossover between the intelligence community and these social media companies. But like, it just doesn't seem like that's the story that Matt Taibbi is interested in pursuing here. It seems like what he's really doing is just engaging in this kind of like PR campaign for Musk, although I don't know, be accused of being one of these liberal bots now using this kind of language. It doesn't seem like he's actually grasping at any of the, maybe the real threads that you could take a look at when it comes to Twitter or big tech or what it was doing. It's also the idea, like, well, look at this crossover between, you know, Dem the Democratic Party and the these social media companies. And then with, when your natural reaction to that is like, well, then it must mean that, like, more conservatives should be involved or can, there's conservative censorship happening. I mean, you've just fucking lost the plot. I mean, that's not... Uh, that I don't think it should be anyone's reasonable conclusion about tugging at any of these threads. So even though I think there might be there might be somewhere buried in there an actual story or something that might be interesting to look at, um, I don't think that's what Taibi is doing. And it's just it sucks to see uh, people that you used to kind of admire uh, sink to these depths. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, let me. Yeah, like Silicon Valley is is mostly neo libs and part like libertarian crypto bros. That's that's Silicon Valley. So there, there's already a they're denying the a huge number of people that are already on their stupid side. Um, and that's why. And, and the, yeah, the interesting story is about people with a certain ideology overseeing a um, a a social media company that is widely perceived to be like the place for pub, the public square. Right. And. That's why progressivism needs to to win out there because progressivism, at least by my definition of it, is just ground rules. It's just setting ground rules so that people don't get taken advantage of and don't get don't lose their rights. So if we're gonna have an a, a 
pure analysis of what went down. We're not going to get it from Matt Taibbi because he's very obviously vengeful right now and like a total dork bag who really wants to dick ride Musk and just wants people to love him again. That, that guy's never going to be able to pull himself out of out of his own ass, no matter how far he pulls at the Edgar skin suit that's covering the cockroach. Like he's he's gone so far in that direction. What we do, what what we can't have is a conversation about what it what a social media company should have to do. But the fact is, if you're criticizing the way that the FBI approaches and tries to intimidate people, you better come correct with some some evidence. And I'll listen to that all day about them trying to intimidate you into doing into a p- supporting a political party one way or another. And that we should use the court system to adjudicate various oversteps from those branches of government. That totally sounds reasonable and and we should do that. But at the end of the day, we really do need to focus on like let's just that that Elon Musk is doing the exact same crap that he uh, criticized uh, Jack Dorsey for doing, but specifically as it pertains to advertisers, because these are companies. And as long as it is a company, I hate to break it to anyone who's trying to break the mold of being a giant media company. Unless you have a purely subscription model, you're always going to have in the back of your mind, what is corporate America gonna go along with? And there's different organizations with different relationships to major people that do the deals with the advertisers. And that will actually give you more freedom. So I think that like TYT has way more freedom than YouTube when dealing with like what's allowed on their platform. And just because, you know, we're smaller and and uh, YouTube is much bigger, we do the stories that we cover. Some get monetized, some don't. Like we're going to cover the like weird stories that no one's going to have a problem monetizing. And we're going to cover stuff that's like, this is a body cam thing. They're not going to monetize it. We don't give a fuck. We're going to actually do the story and it's fine we get to be outside of that but jack dorsey elon musk abc nbc cbs they're all giant media companies that have they're publicly traded they have giant budgets they're international there's always going to be the counterweight of the advertiser saying you can't do that and unless elon musk is going to throw those fools to the curb we already have evidence that he's bending the knee to them, dude, with all the stuff he did as soon as he got in there. And to deny that is just Matt Taibbi being a dumbass. Um, well, yeah, I, 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 I hear you and I agree. Cooked his ass. It's, he had some 40, but he's dead now. Brett just wiped him off the planet. Uh, I think we're, we're good on time. So and also, dumb. I've got a couple bets in this game that I really want to get to watching. I want to see if old Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, can can keep this progress going. I was just trying to think of like a pun I could do in his name and the only thing I could come up with was more like Matt Taibbi gone, sir, because I don't Oh shit. Think that yeah. Ta Taibbi. Ta Taibbi. We're uh, really well, Brett, bringing those knives out over here. Yeah. <laughs> I just tore him a new Matt Taibbi oh, hole. Jesus. Okay. Wow. There we go. Thanks for joining us, yep. Brett. It was a, it was great to talk to you. Where can Again. people find you? Thank you. Sorry, your, I got mad. Your parents on ABC and all that fun stuff. Uh, find me on ABC, uh, which is uh, at uh, this. Uh, d- okay, I got it. December 26th at 9, uh, 8 Central on ABC. I'll be in the year and wrap up where I will talk about much more lighthearted stuff than this. Um, and then also, um, what else do we got? Find me on um youtube.com i guess watch young turk stuff i'm the director of programming there and there's a bunch of stuff you can go check out please do and happy half hour wednesdays at 5 30 p.m pacific 8 30 p.m eastern at twitch.tv slash tyt thanks brett thank you Hey everyone, thank you for listening to The Insurgents. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can find us on iTunes or Spotify or at Substack, theinsurgents.substack.com. You'll get the latest episodes delivered straight to your inbox as well as our newsletter. On Twitter, we are at InsurgentsPod. Tweet at us, harass Ken in our replies, and then send us your hate mail to theinsurgentspod at gmail.com. Thank you once again for listening. <laughs>